sing of me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no seated, we're going to ask the ushers to receive an offering. Let's pray. God, you're so good. We love you so much. We're so glad that you love us. It's a joy for us to bring our best to you, our tithes, our offerings, along with our praise and our worship and our adoration. <laughs> you are so awesome. You're so wonderful. You're so marvelous. And really, it's, it's not enough, but it's the best that we can do because you're just so awesome. You're just, everything else pales. And so we worship you, Father, and we praise you. We, we pray that 
uh, our offerings and our gifts are acceptable in your sight, that you see our hearts and our faith. And uh, we have such an uh, expectation that you're watching over us and you're taking care of us so that we're not scared to give, uh, to bring the first fruits, because we know that you're, that you're adding to us and you're blessing us, seeing that all of our needs are met. And so we pray those blessings on these givers for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just go ahead and wait on the people. seated real quick, but the kids can't leave until Adam comes and makes the announcement whenever he gets back from stowing the offering. <laughs> Here he comes. Here he comes. Go grab that uh, mic with the... Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. I, I already unmuted. You're ready to roll. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So, as everybody knows, Sunday, we're doing the picnic pool party over here at the closed-in pavilion at North Park. Um, five to seven to eat, and then seven to nine is the pool party. You don't have to swim if you don't want to. Just come hang out. We want you guys to bring friends and family. You know, it's kind of like, we're kind of using it as an outreach is what we're, our main kind of plan deal was. <clears throat> kind of maybe reach your neighbor that, you know, yeah, might not be saved or whatever. I talked to Pastor Kim, and we kind of, if somebody wants to get baptized, he said he would do that real quick, you know, before the pool starts, stuff like that. If you want to bring something fine, we're going to have hamburgers on the Blackstone and then some hot dogs and stuff. And, of course, all the yummy, goody stuff that everybody brings. So uh, just wanted to touch base on it and just make sure everybody was clear that we want people to come and we want you to bring people, you know. I mean, if you bring 100 people, then we're going to feed 100 people. Yeah. Praise if you're going to bring 150, then we'll figure it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, just tease. There'll be plenty of food. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to remind everybody, not everybody comes on Sunday and stuff, so maybe we, didn't, we want to make, make sure that everybody knew about it and when it was and what it was about and stuff like that. So 
um, please come. We'll have some fun and some fellowship. So that's what I got. Praise the Lord. Any questions? Going how, so if I'm bringing more than how many, I should let you know. If I'm bringing a busload, you want to know. Yeah, that just so I can have enough food, you know. I mean, right. obviously. You so know. if I'm bringing more than two or more than ten. Well, or, just, yeah, just if you can give, give me a message or whatever or write it down out there in the, in the foyer or whatever would uh -huh. be fine, too. Um, like I said, if you know, if not, then come and bring whoever and then. Yeah. Like I said, we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll try to have plenty of extra for every, of everything. So <laughs> I don't want anybody going hungry. Praise the Lord. So, okay. All right. Thanks. 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 Is that right? Is that right? <laughs> okay. Now kids can be dismissed. <clears throat> How would it be to th baptize somebody by throwing them off the diving board? Would that be? Body slam. For some reason, I always delight in those um, outdoor public baptisms. It feels just a little bit more like Jesus. You know, they baptized them in the Jordan River and, and wherever they found water. And, and uh, they're a part of, uh, yeah, I'll hang on to that. Yeah, if you a part of your baptism experience is your proclamation of your faith. It's your public witness. So, you know, some people want to be baptized in private, and, and I don't know if I get that, maybe I get that, but I like the idea of being baptized in front of as many people as possible. You know, let's just tell everybody. Let's just tell everybody. In fact, the Lord was talking to me about... <clears throat> um, when we were praying, we were praying, we came at 5 o'clock and we prayed. <clears throat> and, um, hey, if the lovebirds in the back row could just calm down. <laughs> I think they were making out in the back row. I'm like, you guys. <laughs> so... So we were praying, and we're praying about revival because we believe that, uh, you know, this kind of the scriptures that we referred to as we prayed was that it says in the Bible, it says, uh, pray for rain in the time of the latter rain. Well, you'd think maybe if it's time for the latter rain, then you don't have to pray because it's just going to, it's a seasonal thing, it'll happen. But that's not what it says. It says, pray for rain in the time of the latter rain. And then it also says that uh, before the Lord returns, it'll be like the former and the latter together, or the early rain and the late rain together, which means it's like a double outpouring. So we're told, so we, so we were praying for revival. We believe that really revival is the cure for our nation. You know, if we, if we, if I had permission to you know, be king for a day and chuck out all the politicians I didn't like and put in all the politicians that I did like, then that'd only last till the next election, and then people would vote their people back in the way they have been, kind of. So only hope for America is changed hearts, and only, only God changes hearts, right? And so, and so um, what the Lord said to me was... I'm trying to say this because, you know, he didn't say it in exactly these words. It's sometimes when the Lord talks to you, you just sort of know. And so in order for us to have the revival that we're praying for, then we have to be bolder to tell our stories. Well, I was sick and the Lord healed me. Or I was afraid and he gave me strength. Uh, or I was, uh, I was in a crisis and he showed me a way out that I never, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, that if we, as a body, I don't mean just faith fellowship, I mean as the church, but it also, you know, obviously includes us. If we're going to, if, if people are going to be hungry for what we have, then they have to taste it by our testimony.
And so after, so that's probably a message to the church, but it's a message to us that it's gonna, there's going to be an impetus on you to tell somebody what he's done for you. And it may not always feel comfortable, but the Spirit will lead you. Um, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, I don't know if we'll look at that verse tonight, but he said when the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you have power and we're to be witnesses. Well, what do witnesses do? They tell what they've seen. They tell what they've experienced. They tell what they know. And uh, sometimes Christians think that being a witness means you've got to be a theologian and have a Bible fight with somebody. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean by Bible fight? You throw a verse and I throw a verse and you throw a verse and I throw a verse. And, you know, yeah, you're not supposed to, you're not, you're not called to throw, have a Bible fight, even though it's fun sometimes. <laughs> but you're called to be a witness, every single one of us. And so we're, there's going to be, uh, part of it will be natural, that you'll just be so excited, people will go, what's up with you? How come you're so, <gasps> you won't believe the Lord gave me a car, or you know, some kind of thing, right? <clears throat> but you're going to have to be, you can't keep it to yourself. We can't keep it to ourselves and, then th and pray for revival. That's like praying for healing and you're you know, still hitting your thumb with a hammer. You know, we're going to have to sow the seeds that cause those kind of fires to ignite. And that means you're going to have to tell somebody. You're going to have to tell somebody. You're going to have to t testify. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, let's pray. God, you're so good. We love you so much. And and uh, we're tickled to have a chance to uh, look here at, in your word. <clears throat> and uh, we believe that, that it's not just up to us to figure, figure it out and, and uh, uh, suss it out for ourselves, the truth that's in here, but that your Holy Spirit helps us. Jesus said that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And so that's our expectation. We didn't gather here to uh, hear uh, somebody smart te teach or speak or uh, be clever, but we're here to meet you. And so uh, we believe that in these scriptures really is life. We believe that your word is alive, that your spirit makes your word alive. And so that's our expectation, that, that we experience the life and the transformation as we open up our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, kind of, you know, I'm not going to recite the whole journey that we've been on it because, you know, I'm, I'm getting tired of going over it. But, but the, the crux of it is God has plans for us. That, he's, that he has, uh, he saved us for a purpose. And, and we're new creatures, but we're created for good works. And so he's got a job for me to do. Some of it y'all can tell because I've been a pastor here now for more than 30 years. And uh, that's part of what he's called me to do. It's not the whole thing. And uh, every, all of us, he's got a plan for all of us. There's somebody that you can touch. There's somebody that you can meet. And we're going to give an account. And so we, we said, first of all, you've got to do these things by faith. It takes faith to do them. Uh, second of all, you have to do them motivated by love. It's, it's a very selfless uh, mission. Uh, and then third, we said you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. And, and fourth, we said uh, uh, you've got to do it in the authority and the power of the name of Jesus. And so Sunday mornings we were talking about that a little bit. We kind of got off on a different step Sunday. Sunday was fun though, wasn't it? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And so uh, we're gonna, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we looked before it at uh, John chapter 7 when Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink, and I'll give you, I'll give you a drink that, that uh, it'll cause, uh, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Well, let's just go there. <coughs> if I'm not careful, I can just preach the same sermon over and over again. If your heart gets full of it, you know, you can just, just keep going over and over. But in, in John chapter 7, this is verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So you're thirsty, you get a drink from Jesus, and then living water comes out of your heart, out of your belly. Verse 39 says, but this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit has been here since before creation. You know, Genesis chapter 1 says that the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. So the Holy Spirit's been here, and uh, we don't uh, maybe understand everything, but we understand it to mean that since the resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is here in a new way. Sometimes English words just don't hardly say the things that you know and feel in your heart, right? And so, um, so Jesus is talking about something that they can't experience now, but they're going to when he's been resurrected, right? And so <clears throat> this is a very important, this business of receiving the Holy Spirit is very important. We looked in Acts chapter 1. Let's go there. Remember, we, we talked about uh, that Jesus said, I'm sending you the same way I was sent. He said, the way the Father sent me, that's how I'm sending you. And we know that Jesus didn't do anything. In, we, he didn't, Jesus had no public ministry until after he was baptized by John, when he was baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit came on him. Well, he's God, right? Well, yeah. If he's God, how does the Holy Spirit come on him? Well... You know, I don't know, but I know he did. And that found, I'm fine with that. Even if I can't explain how you can be God and then have the Holy Spirit come on you, and somehow that's different, it, it's different because Jesus had a fleshly body. He's God in the flesh. But in any case, he's sending us, so he's, he's telling us, you guys don't be going out there until you get this, right? Acts chapter 1, oh, I didn't get there yet. Acts chapter 1. Verses uh, 4 and 5, see, uh, verse 4, 1, 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Stay right here. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So he's already, he's telling you, I've already been talking to you about what the Father has promised, right? For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So these guys are already believers. Remember, he, he breathed after he was raised from the dead. This is what, John chapter 20. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's when they were born again. The Bible says that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, so we're saying... You're called to do something. You're, there's stuff, there's uh, plans that God has for you, missions he's going to send you on to people. He, God loves people. I mean, God loves all of his creation. I mean, he loves the puppies and the kittens, and, you know, he loves, he loves all of his creation. But humans, people have a special place, and so he's called us to minister to people who, who are hurting, who, who are lost, and, and he's got a plan for us. But he, he, his, his passion is for us to do this anointed by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, he says, oh, 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 let me get over here to verse, uh, man, where am I? He says over here in verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So... <clears throat> Sometimes uh, people say, uh, okay, um, but how do I know that it's the Lord? How do I know it's God? If, if I'm, if I'm going to, if I'm going to speak in tongues like they did in Acts chapter two, because we didn't read it, but uh, in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost, they're all in this room and shh, they hear the sound, right? I'm doing sound effects. Did you catch that? Shh, they hear the sound. And then they see the tongues of flame and they start speaking in tongues. 
And, uh, you know, those guys, they're all convinced it's Jesus, the Lord, right? right. No, nobody in that room said, you think this is the devil? <laughs> they, they believed it was the Lord because Je they're just doing what Jesus told them to do, right? <clears throat> and so, um, in our humanity, you know, we don't always focus enough about spiritual things. The thing, you know, we teach kids in school, we teach them, you know, read and write and arithmetic, and, uh, but we don't teach them about the ways of the Spirit so much, you know, unless you go to a Christian school and even most, <laughs> most of those don't really have that much in them. So, so look over here in, in Luke chapter 11. Now, in this, in Luke chapter 11, this is in every one of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic, synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And every one of them have this story. They don't all tell it exactly the same way. So I'm in Luke chapter 11. Somebody, somebody help the girl. She doesn't have her Bible. She doesn't have her Bible. She's got tabs on her Bible, you know. <laughs> but she left it at home, so now she's using the Bible with no tabs. <laughs> okay. Help me in. So, um, so I'm in verse 9 of Luke chapter 11. So I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it'll be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish... Will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? I, you know, it was, you know, you think this is just like too simple to be profound, but when I was first a dad, when Karen was first born, you know, we, Jenny would, you know, at first she breastfed her and then she started uh, feeding her from a bottle. And boy, that little squirt, you know, she'd just be ready to go. She's going to town for that. And I thought, you know, I could just put anything in there. I could put sugar in there. I could put poison in there, and she'd just drink it, you know. But what kind of a creep? How evil would you have to be? I mean, the mo I mean the most pagan, carnal people. They love that little kid, and they're going to do, you know, fight to the death for that little kid. You know, I mean, why? And so Jesus is saying, look, in, who who here would do anything to hurt your own child? Who, who, if he asked for a bread, would you, well, you wouldn't give him a rock? No, you want your kids to have bread. You, you know, I, I don't know how, I'm, I think most moms are like this, but like I think that my wife is like never happier than when Karen is just chowing. You know, she's, she just watches. She watches how much is Karen eating. I'm like, I'm not paying any attention. But she's watching how, how much food did she put on her plate? How much did she eat? And when, how soon was it till she wanted something? more. I mean, that's like a mom thing. Well, I'm glad. Uh, and so, so Jesus said, if, well, let's just go ahead finish this. If he asked for, so I'm at verse 12. If he asked for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will your heavenly Father give to the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, just think about this: how much you love your kid. Like, if your kid, if your kid says, you know, uh, "Mommy, my sh shoes are hurting my feet," you know, remember when Brandon was like going through shoes like every ten minutes? Every ten minutes he could. I mean, it's all of a sudden he went like, it's "Like, holy cow!" You know, like you'd turn heaven and earth. You know upside down to get, because you, you can't stand the thought of your, of your kid ha, being, wearing shoes that hurt their feet or, you know. And if you, come on, you know who you are. You know how selfish you can be. You know if you can love your kid that much, how much more do you think your heavenly father loves you? 
I, my dad loves me to pieces. You know my dad. My dad, he wants the best for me. He just blessed me. Anyway, he came to my house. We, we, we worked. If you saw my Facebook page, you know, Jenny, or my, actually my mom took that picture of me and dad were working. I mean, my dad loves me. He's 80. How old is dad? Dad is uh, 84, you know. And we just had the most fun. Uh, occasionally it wasn't fun. Occasionally it was like, ah, you know. But mostly it was fun, you know, working. He loves me. He wants, me, he wants everything in my life to work. He, he, wants, he wants me to be blessed. He, he wants me to be healthy and happy and prosperous. He, wants, he just loves me. He tried to put that in me. He tried to teach me to be diligent, to do my chores and pay attention to details and get stuff right and don't just be slipshod about everything. I mean, he tried to p- put that in me, all the things that I would need to be sick. And my, and my father, God, loves me so much more than my dad. I mean... I love my dad, and I'm grateful to God for my dad. But, but the God in heaven doesn't want anything worse for me than my dad. I, you know, I know people get hacked off at preachers who seems like they preach about prosperity so they can just get more money in the offering. And I hope you don't think that about me, because I want you to know that your father, he loves you so much, he wants everything to work in your life. He doesn't want you goofing anything up. He, he doesn't want you wasting stuff. He wants you to put everything to good use. He, he wants you to see a harvest. Come on. He doesn't want your eggs to burn. He wants your eggs to be yummy in the morning. He, he wants everything good for you. He loves you. He wants you to have more than enough. He wants you to have so much that you've got extra stuff to give other people whom he loves. And so, so Jesus, come on, this is Jesus comparing the heart and love of a natural father and says, saying it really hardly doesn't even compare to the love of the father God who would send his own son to die for the sins of humanity, to redeem a people back to himself. So if God loves you that much, he will not let you get anything fake if you're asking for the Holy Spirit. And you just got to believe it. You got to receive it by faith. You just got to believe that your heavenly father loves you that much. That he'll, I mean, if he had to split hell wide open, he'd make sure you're not getting anything wrong. And so, because I asked that question, I was, uh, um, let's see if I'm in a place where I can, well, I was, uh, you know, a lot of you know my story. I, I was my my grandpa was a pastor. My mom was a preacher's kid, and so uh, my mom and my dad, when they were little kids, got saved in the same revival that my grandpa was preaching. So my grandpa was preaching a revival, and my mom and dad both they're little kids. They both got saved and baptized in that revival, and then the, you know, Grandpa Cook was he got sent to a different church, and they and then my dad didn't run into my mom until until. Uh, he was already out of high school, and I think my mom was a senior in high school, and, and she was working at an ice cream place, and, and uh, he had a carload of his friends, and, oh, look, there's, you know, there's Linda that he knew whenever he was little. And they, of course, fell in love, and here I am. So, uh, so, then, so then I was in church my whole life, but when I was nine years old, we had a revival in our church, and the preacher, uh, he's a guest preacher, he came and he said, he said, if you didn't accept Jesus on your own for yourself, you're not going to heaven yet. Just because your family's all Christian doesn't mean that you're going to heaven. You have to make that choice for yourself. And I just thought, oh, I, I never made that choice. I just thought I was going to heaven because everybody in my family is. We all, all believe in Jesus and we all go to church. And uh, so that very night, I ran to the altar and gave my heart to Jesus. So I was, it was March the 15th, 1968. I was nine years old. And, uh, and we stayed in the same church for quite a while uh, until I was in junior high. And then when I was in junior high, there were some people in our church that started getting hungry for the Holy Spirit. Some of them had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were kind of keeping quiet about it. But sometimes it's kind of hard to keep quiet about that. And, uh, and then... Uh, our Sunday school class, our Sunday school teacher, we got, we had a, a high school kid 
was teaching our, Sunday, our junior high Sunday school class. He was either a high school or just graduated from high school. And he was spirit-filled, and we loved him. And he just taught us the Bible straight up. Like, he didn't bring the quarterlies and go through the lessons of the quarterlies. You know, he just taught us straight up, and we loved it. And some of the other Sunday school teachers were mad because, because they were, kids were leaving his class to come and be in our class. That was Tony Mack. And so, and Tony's dad was, you know, obnoxiously nice. Tony's dad uh, was a greeter at church, and so he'd shake your hand, praise the Lord, good to see you this morning. And so we were like German. We were not in, we weren't hug, hugging people, and we, you know, and so a little bit I was creeped out by that, but a little bit I craved that. Because I'm born again. I'm born again since I was nine years old. I'm born again. And there's something in uh, Hilbert McWilliams and in his son Tony and his, and, uh, uh, his daughter Carol and, and other, you know, Trilla Myers and those people, they've got something. And in my heart, I'm starving for that. I'm hungry for that. And I'm going to say, I believe that the born-again human spirit is created specifically with that capacity to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said some interesting things <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 9. Even if your flesh is creeped out about it, like even if, you're, if you think that you're like smart and, and all that, uh, that speaking in tongues stuff is all superstitious and stuff, uh, did I say Matthew 9? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Copy that, she says. <clears throat> then in, uh, um, let me start, let's see. Oh, I'll start with verse 14. This is Matthew 9, 14. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus says, because we have better food. No, he, did, he didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, because they have peach cobbler where Jesus is at. <laughs> Pastor Kim can't eat peach cobbler. All right, all right, all right. And so, um, so in, in verse 15, Jesus answers them. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now look at verse 16. Jesus says, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. You know, an old garment, you've washed it and washed it and washed it, and it shrank up, although it's going to shrink up. But a new piece, the, uh, the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. So if you tried to patch an old garment with new cloth, you'd wind up making the tear worse. It would destroy the garment, right? That's the Jesus' point, right? Verse 17, nor do they put wine, new wine, into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, this is, a, this is a parable kind of teaching that Jesus would use because even though I'm sure Jesus wants all of his garments to be nicely patched and he wants all of his wine skins to be safe and sound, that's not what he's trying to tell us with this, right? Okay, so this has to be, this has to represent something. Well, I'm going to say that new wine represents the Holy Spirit. And so, Jesus says, you can't put new wine in old wineskin. You got to have a new wineskin. Or everything's ruined, everything's lost, everything's wasted. Well, if the Holy Spirit, if, if, the Holy, if the new wine symbolizes the Holy Spirit, then the new wineskin must represent the reborn human spirit. And the same way that 
you, you get your new wineskin and you do the stuff that you got to do to it. You put oil here and do this and stitch it this way and stuff. If you get it ready. The new wineskin is ready for the new wine. Everybody say that. The new wineskin wine is ready for the new wine. It's made that way on purpose. So I want to say, if you're born again, then your spirit comes ready-made. It's like if you would have, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm not a, a great fisherman and I'm not a great uh, a boat, boater, but I'm thinking of these like aluminum boats and stuff. You know, they got a, the transom in the back is, I know that word, the transom in the back is all square and it's made for putting an outboard motor on it. But also they'll have those like little loop guys on the side that you can row it like even if you got the outboard motor, you probably got a row, you got, a, got, a, you got an oar or a couple in case you run out of gas halfway across the lake, right? And so if you got this boat and it's a beauty and you're just rowing yourself everywhere you go, somebody might say, you know, honey, you could put an outboard motor on the back of that guy. It's made for it. In fact, that's really how it's designed to work is with the motor on the back. You are born again. You have a new spirit on the inside of you. And that spirit on the inside of you is made for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's, it's designed that way. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you still go to heaven. God, we still love you. Jesus loves you. You'll go to heaven. Your sins are forgiven. But you're not going to catch as many fish. Come on. You're not going to go from, from uh, honey, did they say honey hole? Is that what they say? Honey hole is where you always catch a lot of fish. Is that there? Donnie's giving me the affirmative. Okay. So, so you're, you're lucky if you make it to one honey hole, but, but if you got an outboard on that guy, you're zoom, zoom, zoom. You're coming up with a stringer like this, and I'm coming to your house for a fish dinner. Right? Okay. So this new spirit on the inside of you is hungry for the Holy Spirit. So I'm just saying this, uh, this is my conviction, that if you're born again, you are hungry in your heart for the Holy Spirit, even if your brain is going, I don't get this. I don't have a clue. So now, so, I, so I'm nine years old. Kim is nine years old, and, and I, got, I gave my heart to Jesus. I got baptized. And then we had some neighbors that lived out in the same, they lived out in German Township where we lived. And uh, they went to a little Pentecostal church in a little town close by. And the Stout family, they had two boys that were my age, and I used to, you know, out in the country, man, it is miles to anywhere. And so uh, I would ride my bike halfway, and they'd ride their bikes halfway, and then we'd meet, and we'd go riding through the country around. And so David was just a year older than me, and Jimmy was two years older than me, and they tried to get me to jump out of the hay mow, but I wouldn't do it. And... Uh, uh, so they invited me to go to church with them on Wednesday night. My family didn't go to Wednesday night church. We lived, you know, it seemed like forever out in the country. So we went on Sundays. We didn't go on Wednesday night. And so they said, hey, Kim, or they probably said Kimmy. <laughs> Do you want to come and go to church with us? And of course, I'm, yeah, because <laughs> I just got sisters at home. And anytime I can go play with the guys that, you know, that's, and uh, I would like to say I'm always spiritual, but, you know, it really it's, and so, so here in this little Pentecostal church, uh, they, the way their service went, they would sing songs and they'd have offering and prayer and stuff. And then they would send the kids downstairs and do the kids' lesson. Uh, we used to call it YPE, Young People's Endeavor. And uh, then the adults would have a Bible study. But in the, so in this song service, everybody in the whole congregation would, we had wooden pews, then we would turn around in our pews and we'd kneel and pray out loud. And, and uh, it was just the most, excuse me, I'm going to cry. It was the most wonderful sound in the world to hear all those saints of God praying out loud. I just, I, here I am, I'm probably 10, 11, I think I was maybe almost a junior high. And so I would sit with the stout boys uh, and, uh, and, uh, their cousins, their uncles, uh, uh, um, Danny Stout was their uncle. And so I thought he was cool. 
And so I would be usually sitting in the same pew with all those kids. And I'm sort of, I was sort of ashamed to admit it, but I would listen to their prayer. Because I'm, what am I, I'm 11 or something, right? And uh, I'd listen, and I would think, you shouldn't be listening to somebody else's prayer. But I'd think, how come I don't understand what he's saying? And I, I even asked the Lord about that. I said, you know what? I have good hearing. And he's praying loud enough for me to hear. Why don't I understand what he's saying? It never occurred to me he's speaking in another language. I mean, I'm 11, maybe not the most sophisticated cosmopolitan person in the planet. But nothing about it turned me on. I just loved those people. And they were, they were always sweet to me. And... I loved that time of the service. I was, you know, when I was 11, it was way easier for me to spin around in my pew and then nail down in my pew. Uh-uh. But I, so I'm, what I'm telling you is there was something in my heart that was hungry for that. Because a born-again human spirit is created for that. In fact, Jesus says, don't you get out there and be, start doing all this stuff until you get this. You've got to have this. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, in John 14, well, how do I know? How do I know if it's the Lord or if I'm just, your heart will tell you. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And I'm starting here with verse, uh, probably verse 15. (coughs) Oh, let's read verse 12. Because, you know, you just hardly, you want to start at verse 1. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Verse 12. Are you got it, Leanna? <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he'll do also. And greater works than these he'll do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father... And he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So an unbeliever, their spirit, they are not born again yet. Their spirit hasn't been made new. They don't, they don't connect to the spirit realm the same way. And I'm thinking... If, if an unbeliever tried to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that would be a disaster. Nothing good would come out of that. The Spirit of truth is, on verse 17, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So they, even though they're not born again, they're a little bit familiar with the Holy Spirit because they hang around Jesus. And Jesus is absolutely full to the brim. The Bible says that Jesus received the Holy Spirit without measure. Like Jesus had unlimited Holy Spirit. And so we kind of would say, it's probably tough to prove, uh, from straight from Scripture, but we would say that today the whole body of Christ on the earth has unlimited Holy Spirit, but we just have the Spirit by measure. Jesus had the Spirit without measure, but we have the Spirit by measure, but we can increase our measure if we go about it, right? If we study the Lord, if we study the Word and we flow in the Spirit, We can grow. We can grow. We can grow in anointing. We can grow in wisdom. We can grow in sensitivity. We can, that's another, that's a whole other sermon. All right. So 
Ah. Let's go to... F Let me make this point again. I may not have made it. So if you're not born again, then your, your spirit is not made new. Remember John chapter 3? Jesus said what? Jesus said you can't... He said you can't enter the kingdom of God. You can't even see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. And Nicodemus said, huh? And then... This is my paraphrase. And then... And then Jesus said, whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. So this new spirit I have on the inside of me, I'm grateful for. This new spirit was hungry to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit because it's made to. It's like the boat that's got the transom all set up for the outboard. But if you don't have the outboard, you're just rowing your little fingers off, right? You got that? Okay. So, uh, if I know that sometimes people, their flesh, you know, in our flesh, we can interfere with the desires of the Spirit in our heart. Does that make sense? Uh, and so, I know that there are born-again people who, who would argue this with me. There are born-again people who say, you're, there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. There's, you don't have anything. You're just making that up. That's... Or you're operating from the devil. That's the devil speaking in tongues. That's not the Holy Spirit, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. But those people are, are you know, misguided at best. Right. And so uh, this is just, I'm trying to, get, let's go stay with the Bible, okay? So then, so now, finally, let's go to 1 John chapter 1, uh, 2. 1 John chapter 2. Now, if you're born again, you are born of the Spirit, right? Yes. And, and the Bible says that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is like a seal, like a stamp of authenticity on us. It also says that the Holy Spirit is our down payment on the whole rest of the inheritance. That's a whole other sermon, too. But um, here in 1 John chapter 2, he's addressing this issue about fake people. How can I know the fake people? Like, he's, he's going to talk about Antichrist. You know, when Antichrist comes, uh, he's not going to look mean. He's not going to look evil. He's going to look slick. And people are going to go, Finally, here's a politician who knows what he's talking about. Here's the man with the plan. And so, but we're not going to be faked out. If we're still here, you know, and we might be, he, you know, I'm sort of expecting the Antichrist shows up on the scene, you know, way before the rapture takes place because he's, I think he's going to start out really popular and nice and everybody's going to love him. <laughs> and so here in chapter 2, of 1 John, I'm going to start with verse 18. Little children, it's the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it's the last hour. They went out from of us. They went out from us. Check that out. Verse 19, they went out from us. Antichrist, Antichrist, false prophets and false teachers and false Christ, they started with us. They went out from us, but they were not of, they weren't really with us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And so even if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you still have a spirit connection. And so the same way when Kim was 
When Kim was, I don't know, I'm thinking 11 or 12 years old or whatever, I started going to the little Pentecostal church. It was the Chansey Church of God. Wonderful, wonderful people, as far as I knew. Uh, I'm a born-again believer, and I'm attracted to those Pentecostal expressions and, and those Pentecostal experiences and those Pentecostal moves of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit that is connected to me that we just read it here, the, uh, I have an uh, anointing from the Holy One to know what's true and what's right. And we have said, your brain can get twisted and you can get your brain, your brain can get off track. But if you listen to your heart, you know. You know. And so we have people come to church here that aren't baptized in the Holy Ghost and they don't speak in tongues, but still they love us. We have people that come to church here, they don't speak in tongues, they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. But boy, when I give a message in tongues and Jennifer gives the interpretation, they love it. They cry because your, your spirit is built for that. And so no wonder Jesus would say, look, don't you, don't you go out there and now, is there a faith aspect? Yeah. You still got to have faith. You got to have faith that, that our God is the God he says he is. We have to have faith that my father loves me, and he's not, if I'm asking for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give me a demon. And when, so whenever I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, that thought came to me. How do I know this is God? And I might have even said something to Sharon or one of the kids that was around me. And, they, and uh, I think they gave me this verse. The Bible says that you can trust God to make sure that you get the right thing. Whew. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Your heart is hungry for this. You, uh, and even if your, your brain is not convinced, listen to your heart. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to manipulate anyone to, to have an experience, but I want you to go to your mission prepared. I don't want you to fall flat on your face. I want you to have the equipment you need to get the job done. Hey, before I forget, speaking of tongues and interpretation, hey, you, Cynthia, you have this. I got this is here for you. So you, it's right here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, my niece, or excuse me, my nephew's wife, Anne, I, at, she watches all, nearly all of our church services. And so... Uh, she's a great typist and a transcript, transcriber. And so I asked Ann, hey, would you transcribe all those interpretations to tongues? And she said, yeah. And so she's already started doing it. And, and, uh, and Jenny specific, specifically asked her for the one uh, from Sunday. And so this is the one from Sunday. So Cynthia asked for it. Okay, let's pray. God, we love you so much. You're so good. And uh, we believe your word. And... Uh, uh, you know, the realm of the Spirit is really not like the natural realm sometimes that we live and walk in. But we believe your Bible. We believe that Jesus knew what was going on, that Jesus knew what was best. And so all we can say is we want more. We want more of your glory. We want more of the power of your Holy Spirit. We want to walk in greater authority as we, as we use the name of Jesus. We want to have greater discernment to, to be able to tell good from evil and, and right from wrong. And, and we are acutely aware that there are many false voices. It seems like the voices have just multiplied and multiplied. But we will know the false voices because your Holy Spirit has touched our hearts. And so we're uh, crying out for more. We, we want to be the people that you've called us to be. We want to have success on the ministry and missions that you send us, the people that you send us to, we, we want to have effective ministries. And so we want everything that you've got for us and uh, we'll surrender uh, what would be uh, prideful things that might get in our way so that we can, have, uh, we can have your life and your power flow through us and uh, we can shine a light uh, in a world that's so full of darkness and we can... Uh, 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 share hope where there's so much despair. And uh, we'll see revival in our land, in our nation, in our town, in our church. And we'll testify of your goodness and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.